On this university campus, young women say they're fed up with all the victim shaming and blaming that comes when intimate images are shared without consent. When you send that to someone in confidence and they're going to use it against you and threaten to show other people who you don't want seeing it. It's not fair. Unfair and infuriating, says 27-year-old Serena Thompson. Because it mostly just happens to women. And if it's not happening to men, then people don't take it seriously. But it is getting more attention. It started with the high-profile suicides of Amanda Todd and Retea Parsons. The girls from BC and Nova Scotia were cyberbullied and harassed, their intimate images shared by peers and strangers over and over. The federal government made that a crime five years ago. In 2015, police forces in Canada handled 340 cases. By 2017 and 2018, that number jumped to about 1,500 cases annually, with the total number now surpassing 5,000. I think it's going to increase over the next few years, increase with the knowledge that the law is there, increase with the ability of technology to obtain these photos. It's sometimes called revenge porn since the perpetrator is often a scorned lover seeking revenge. But 20% of cases involve perpetrators under 18. Digital literacy expert Matthew Johnson says their motive is different. The boys in particular do it to earn social capital, uh, to earn the approval of their friends. He says boys are five times more likely to share a girl's intimate image without consent if they hold traditional gender stereotypes and believe the girl deserved it. Do you have consent? Because that's the, the only question that ever needed to be asked. Did you have consent? No, why did she and why didn't she and all of that? Research also shows young people are not deterred by the new law and that shifting the focus from victim blaming to teaching respect and consent would be more effective in stopping this crime. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina.